Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks, the Internet's leading all things Charles Band podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jared Hornbeck, but if you want to, just for today, you can call me by my full name, which is Jared Teresa Maria Valeria Iscariot of Hell. (laughs) <laughs> but I am not uh, scouring through the underworld here alone. Who is with me? Well, it's me, Born to Raise Hell, Steve Guntley. And this is the podcast about branding typewriters, giant feet, and spine ripping. That's because this is a podcast about Dark Angel, The Ascent. A uh, sadly overlooked movie from the early era of Full Moon, uh, uh, one that I'm excited to get into. I'm very excited because we have a returning guest here with us today. Who has come back to join us today, Jared? Uh, well, you know, these are B movies. We do the show, we watch B movies, right? Some people will automatically attribute a, a B movie to being a bad movie. Yeah. And sometimes those move, you know, those B movies are actually good movies. Some people may even might even call them good bad movies or good mm. bad flicks if they want to get more casual about it. And it would be yeah, yeah. yeah, it would be a disservice if we did not bring back the host of good bad flicks to talk about what I consider to be a just a kind of a good just a good flick. Yeah. But yeah. anyway, uh, Cecil Trachenberg is back with us again uh, talking about Dark Angel the Ascent. Cecil, we're so glad that you decided to join us again. Thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you're on this one. Yeah this this one was uh, this one was a treat. I had not seen this before, but I know you two are both big fans of this one, and uh, its reputation is generally really good. But it's also just very underseen. Uh, it's one of those movies that's kind of slipped through the cracks for whatever reason. And uh, if we do one thing with this podcast, we'd like to draw people's attention to the movies that are worthy of said attention. And I think Dark Angel is definitely one of them. Really came out showing our hands really early. Yeah, at this yeah. Point. <laughs> no, look, hey, hey, why, why be coy? Why no, be coy sus- no it? suspense for anyone listening to see where we're going to land. Although I'm pretty sure, like, I sometimes tip my hand in like promo posts too. So I yeah. feel like everybody coming in kind of has a sense of how we feel about this movie. Now, generally, we let guests pick the movies. Occasionally, if there's a guest who isn't, we really want to have on the show because it's a content creator or an actor or a writer or a filmmaker or whoever or author that we really um, admire, they might say, well, I don't really know Full Moon that well. Like, what do you think would be a good fit? That happens from time to time. But sometimes people do pick a movie and Cecil, you picked this one and it just happened to work out and align that the movie, you know, became a- available for you to talk about. And so you were here first for Dr. Mordred, which was a full moon movie that uh, I like quite a bit. I know Steve has some fondness for. Yeah. And it just, it, it's just, it's another one of those movies within the canon of full moon that I think is remembered pretty fondly and probably even reappraised uh, more so in the recent years. But you seemed to go directly beeline to this one next. And so I just want to know your history, like with this movie, since your history with full moon stuff tends to predate mine and steve's for a lot um i know like when i found this and i'll get into that a little bit later but i want to know from you like what was your history with this movie is this one that you kind of discovered like while the paramount years were still a thing yeah i had discovered this because um i was uh i was dating a girl who was working at blockbuster at the time and Mm. they um full moon was just fully ramped in uh getting all that paramount money and so what they were doing was uh they were doing all sorts of promotional things with like the the video stores and with the bigger chains like blockbuster uh they were sending them these uh promotional calendars and every month um there was a picture in the you know in the top part of the calendar and it was whatever movie they were releasing that month and so uh, the girl who I was with, um, she had given me one of the calendars because she didn't really care about these kind of movies. And uh, I thought it was awesome because I was like, oh, I get to see because, you know, Charles Band always playing these out, you know, with the poster first and then you will make the movie revolve around the poster. Yeah. So um, I had uh, this calendar and I'm going through it and there were all these different ones that like see people and Mandroid and uh and dark angel was one and i was like 
oh, this is cool because it's it's not an, a pre-existing one. It's just something entirely new and entirely onto it. You know, is this going to be a, a new beginning of a franchise? Yeah. They, that was their whole thing was they they revolved everything around franchises. And uh, so I thought it was really cool. And uh, so I got it. And oh, the only thing it had was it always had the day that it was going to be hitting the video stores. So I was always <clears throat> at the store like the day whenever a new full moon movie was coming in. And so I went in and I rented it and uh, I really enjoyed it like from the first go because it was so very different mm. from all the other full moon movies. And not to say that I liked it, you know, I want my full moon movies to be different, but it was just it was so unique and uh, just I mean, it was really sort of a unusual love story. Yeah. And I like that so much. And one of the things that I attest to how good this movie actually is, is on the IMDb, who they're insanely critical about everything. Yeah. It has mm -hmm. a 5.8. Now, for, for a movie that's like, like this. That's a perfect 10 for a full moon movie. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yeah, like, yeah. A movie like this getting a 5.8 on the IMDb, that that is a you know yeah exactly a full moon 10 yeah you, know? you can take that to the bank that's like wow yeah pe people uh because people tend to take these movies at face value right they tend to like just look at it it's like okay it's a cheapy uh direct-to-video horror film let's just not really give this any kind of credence or kind of look at between the lines of what they're trying to do and i think this is a movie that sort of lends itself to a little bit more analysis and a little uh i, I think Absolutely. we can extend a little more goodwill towards it and towards its intentions because it's it's a smarter film than you get with a lot of these full moon uh features absolutely it's uh it, it kind of is is just an unusual idea and there's all sorts of little unique concepts in there and uh i think the effects were, were very good and uh like angela featherstone i thought just was really beautiful in it like she yeah. pulled off the the being a demon you know like you would think all right this guy he he does have some sympathy for her and and of course she she's pretty and but like not not like supermodel pretty but like very unique pretty yeah and very, i would very say and especially eyes, yeah. she's she's very striking and i think the way she's lit also and I and I think she's really strong in this movie, considering that this is her first starring role. I mean, she had two really small roles in Frantic and uh, Army of Darkness, uh, where really sort of very small, basically unspeaking roles. And yeah, here, for, you know, she carries. Who... Go ahead, Steve. Oh yeah, just for those who are clocking it, she's the uh, girl in the S Mart at the end of Army of Darkness when uh, uh, in the original theatrical ending. I I did not put that together until I was looking at her IMDb just now. Yeah, and we're talking about IMDb and we're talking about critical reviews. And this has, um, you know, it has, uh, I would say, an audience score that's probably slightly lower than it should be. But the actual IMDb score at 5.8 is on the high side of where these movies generally tend to land. But this movie, like you said, to Cecil, it has, it, it has a lot of sort of odd direct references two other kind of existing properties. And one person who saw this movie was Paul Schrader. Mm -hmm. And he has a really fun quote. I don't like to read quotes from books too often when I'm citing material that we're talking about, but I won't, I'll, I'll sort of butcher it if I don't read it directly from the text is um, he saw this movie and he said, were you to put Schre um, himself and Larry Cohen in bed together, put a gun to their heads and tell them to fuck while William Peter Blatty watched through the keyhole. <laughs> Dark Angel is the movie that you would get. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. That's a good quote. That's a good quote. That is yeah. I could see how you could that that would be easy to butcher trying to <laughs> trying to get that all together. Yeah. And I think like so this this movie definitely caught the attention of of people and uh, I, I love the fact that you were kind of there from day one on, on this one because this is a, maybe not this movie specifically, but movies like this, there's just a, a type of movie that screams late night cable when I see it. Mm. And, and, and this is one where I, I don't know that I actually saw it for the first time on late night cable, but I do know that, you know, ha not having rented it myself as an adolescent, you know, when this would have come out, I definitely 
would have uh, saw it that way. And I, I don't think I ever landed on it because if I had, I probably would have stopped and I probably would have watched it for a while. And there's so many unique, um, aside from the the narrative and the you know content of the movie in that way, there's so many unique little stylistic flourishes. And so before we get too deep into any specific scene steve why don't you just fire off a couple stats about this movie first absolutely so dark angel the ascent was released august 31st 1994 it's directed by linda hassani and it's written by matthew bright and it stars angela featherstone da daniel markell nicholas worth charlotte stewart milton james mike genovese christina stoika and heroes which is just the name of the dog in the movie but i love it when dogs <laughs> get a credit in a film um <clears throat> excuse me so um, we're, we're recording a little bit out of order, but uh, as of last week, you would have heard us talk about Mandroid and Invisible, the Chronicles of Benjamin Knight, because these are two important uh, characters in the sort of cinematic uh, uh, low-rent MCU that um, Charles Bam was kind of experimenting with at this time. He wanted to build out his own stable of superheroes that reminded him of his favorite Marvel Comics characters. And the intention was that they were going to cross over with each other, appear in each other's movies, and eventually have one big film where they all come together uh, and, you know, like a, like a proto Avengers, basically. And uh, other than, yeah, so we had Mandroid and Benjamin Knight on the team. We also had Dr. Mordred uh, set to be on the team. And we also had Veronica, who is a uh, reformed demon warrior who escapes from hell to live amongst humans and act as their nocturnal protector. And that is our main character here. Um, so first of all, we need to say a, a couple weeks ago, I think we came across our first female director and I'm just like, oh man, okay. Yeah. We really have not encountered many of those. And I'm happy to be proven wrong that we keep running into them, like kind of coincidentally in a row. It's a hard thing to figure out like how many female directors are working in full moon because a lot of these movies are not represented in any, uh, the, the research has not really been done. There's no real like comprehensive database. So it's always exciting when we run into a female director. Well, so much so, Steve, to your point, that without even looking at it, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're talking about Anita Rosenberg from Assault yeah. to the Killer Bimbos. Like, you know, uh, in that movie we covered about it probably a month and a half ago. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you don't even have to, I don't even have to look at which one yeah. it is. Just encountering our first female director was was a big thing. And uh, yeah, and Linda Hassani here taking over this, and we'll talk a little bit more when we get into production about how this kind of came to be because it's sort of convoluted. Yeah, uh, how it actually finally ended up with Linda Hassani, aside from the fact that she was apparently friends with Barbara Crampton. Yeah, that's which played the, no small role in it. That was the Charlie Band connection for sure, and uh, I think this is her one and only feature film, surprisingly. Uh, but apparently, she's a very prolific. Uh, television and commercial director, especially up in Canada where she's relocated. Uh, but, you know, she kind of broke out onto the scene with her a thesis film that she made in college that apparently got optioned by Steven Spielberg, who was really impressed by it and wanted to expand on it. That project never really came together, but she was demonstrating herself to be a very reliable kind of journeyman director. Now, the original person attached to this film was going to be uh, uh, Jeff Burr, so he was working at the time on Puppet Master 4 and 5. Charles Band really liked what he was doing with it. And he said, look, I've got a great project for you. I'm going to take you off this next movie I have assigned to you, which is Oblivion. I'm going to give that to Sam Irvin. And you come out here to Romania and work on Dark Angel. So he did. He got a few weeks into pre-production. And then the project got delayed. Uh, so Jeff Burr uh, accepted a job to direct, uh, I believe it was Pumpkinhead 2 uh, was what he went on to work on instead, uh, which with has, which has one of the greatest subtitles of all time, Blood Wings. I do love the <laughs> subtitle of Pumpkinhead 2. Uh, so he went to work on that. Uh, and yeah, and so then uh, Charles met uh, Linda Hassani through Barbara Crampton, and uh, she got the gig. And she had uh, about four months and a $350,000 budget to get this all together. She did have to go shoot in Romania to put it all together. And she's also working on a, off of a script by Matthew Bright. Now, you may remember him. He's come up on our show before. He is one of the oddball performance artists of the Mystic, Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. Uh, he co-wrote and starred in Forbidden Planet with uh, Danny and Forbidden Richard Zone. Altman. Oh, excuse me, Forbidden Zone. Thank you. And he wrote the masterfully batshit script for Shrunken Heads, which is one of our favorite discoveries that we've had on this show. Definitely check out Shrunken Heads. 
We're going to talk about him a little more in a couple weeks because uh, he made his directorial debut with Freeway, uh, starring Reese Witherspoon, which we're going to be talking about both films in that series. Um, which I have to just say right off the bat, like someone is probably scratching their head being like, what is the connection to Charles Band there? It's loose. But it's you know very what? loose. Yeah. You get the opportunity to talk about Freeway and Confessions of a Trick Baby. And it's like, you want to take advantage of that. So yeah. we found a way to shoehorn it in to make it all make sense. We found a way to make it make sense. Yeah, because I, I think Freeway 2 is like a full moon pickup. Like, I think they they did actually distribute it. They never produced it, but it was a pickup. And, uh, you know, it's just not going to make sense without Freeway 1. And, you know, we're, we're going to talk about both of them. Why not? Yeah, I just wanted an excuse to watch that movie again and then talk about it's it on microphone. It's been a while, yeah. But this, so, I love this. So, like, 1993-94... We're getting sort of like the, I guess, the back end of the early Paramount years. Yeah. And I just really love this kind of stuff the studio is making at this time. Like they're, to me, some of the best stuff that they would make as Full Moon as a company came out during this like really short period of time. You've yeah. got Subspecies 2 and 3. You've got now Puppet Master 4 and 5 are a lot of fun and successful to varying degrees in different ways. But yeah. what I like so much about Puppet Master 4 and 5 is less the actual movies we got and more the story of what the plans for Puppet Master were at that time mm -hmm. with the Puppet Wars trilogy and all that stuff and like what it could have been. And then, oh, this is going to be Puppet Master, the movie, the theatrical one. And then it was like a really ambitious thing. Oh, we got to let's break this instead into two movies. And you've got Oblivion and you've got Shrunken Heads and you've got a lot of these like really fun Full moon movies. I mean, and even stuff like Mandroid and Invisible, or, or, which I don't think are as successful. No, still kind of showing that their am, their ambitions in a lot of ways. And yeah, so the fact that Dark Angel falls into this too. I'm like, this is really to me like the 93, 94 is my personal sort of like glory days or high point of the of full moon stuff. Like this this movie in particular, one of my favorites. But so I'm very vocal about subspecies two, how much i really love that movie and it's like two and three three i don't think is as good by itself but it's really one story yeah but i mean i just love mm -hmm. like all of this zany stuff and how varied it all is it's like yeah you look at shrunken heads and oblivion and this movie all coming out and subspecies three all coming out in 1994 from the same studio it, I, it just makes me smile that this Absolutely. was the stuff they were making at that time and it makes me really wish that, uh, you know, I, I, I think a lot of us have uh, had Roger Corman on the mind a lot recently because when we're recording this, he he recently passed away. And he's one of those guys like if you have enjoyed a movie in the last 50 years, you have Roger Corman to thank at some core level, you know, because his tendrils have yeah. gone so far. And it makes me wish that that happened more at full moon. You know, I wish that there were. The future Bogdanoviches and and Coppolas and like Spielbergs and people coming out of the full moon camp because when I see this movie I'm seeing like a lot of ambition going into this meager production okay so this is Matthew Bright wrote this as an homage to Taxi Driver which I don't know if I would have put together immediately but watching it like with that in mind I'm like oh yeah no this is definitely like kind of like a supernatural Taxi Driver that's a fun idea um, it's also a really wickedly satirical movie. The idea that your main character is a demon who escapes from hell and finds that the world above is too thick with sin and corruption that she decides to like go on a rampage <laughs> is a great premise. It's really funny and it's really sharp. Like she's literally from hell and she's disgusted by the way that human beings live their lives. And that's kind of an amazing setup. Um, and you do have... I, I would argue... I was texting Jared earlier when I was watching this. I'm like, I would argue that this is on a purely technical level, maybe one of the best made movies in the full moon catalog. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's all natural lighting and it, 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 the, there's, there's like much more sophisticated shot composition going into this than a lot of these do, you know, so much of full moon filmmaking is very slapdash. And the fact that they were able to insert some artistry with their limitations into this film mm -hmm. is really fucking cool. Um, and I think they, they're far more successful in a lot of these ways. Like, I can kind of see shades of like a like a Coen Brothers movie in here. Like if you had a, a bigger production value or something. Like I I think there's a lot of potential with this idea. Um, it feels like they had more time. They yeah 
you know, I mean, I like guess four months is pretty decent for a full moon. Absolutely. Like, yeah. I mean, a lot of full moon movies, they they do. I, I love them dearly, but oh, yeah. they kind of uh, they kind of rush to the to the finish line. And uh, this one, it really felt like they gave the story room to breathe. And yeah. Um, you know, they, they just had, they probably actually had a, a decent pre-production time. Like, I don't know a ton about the actual making of it. Um, but this is one where I feel that they actually, uh, just for whatever reason, they gave it just that little bit extra because there are some full moon movies that I do think that I enjoy. Yeah. But I feel that if they would have just maybe given them a couple more weeks or something or just a, a little bit more, they could have been something else. And this, I felt like they had a complete story. They had everything that they wanted to and they were able to actually make it. And it came out. And I think it was um, like you guys are saying, it is definitely one of the the best of them. But unfortunately, it is one of the lesser known ones and it's such a yeah. shame because it is legit good and it is just not as well known as like the puppet masters and the transfers and not to diminish them they're great no, no. but i think that this should be thrown in there with that as well like hey this one's also awesome yeah yeah and it's i think it's not to say that this movie doesn't have its limitations and i think it makes a uh, kind of the biggest misstep i think that i'm seeing here is that well, it's just Romania in general, um, because I think Romania was the wrong setting for this movie. Like for the hell scenes, I think they found an amazing like they, they found some amazing looks for that. But for the main story, this feels like it's supposed to be very quintessentially American. This feels like it's supposed to be like New York in the 70s, a la Taxi Driver. It feels like it's trying to go for a gritty commentary on American society in particular. And you could not imagine a more european looking location than bucharest <laughs> in 1994 like it is so european looking like that it, you know and they, i think they've tried to retcon this a bit and say like they don't want it to take place in the real world like it's kind of a fantasy version of the real world that's up top i don't think that's i don't know i i feel like that's a little bit of a cop-out i think we call that the streets of fire model of screenwriting right <laughs> <laughs> or the room it was a comedy the whole time yeah, you know. Um, no, you're totally right, Steve. It's not scuzzy enough. That's my biggest knock on the, the movie is that when she comes up and sees just the den of sin and iniquity that Earth is, it needs to be grim and it needs to be grimy. And just Romania at that time, even in the city parts, are, are too pastoral, too European, yeah, too picturesque in a lot of ways. And it just, yeah, it doesn't really work in that sense. And that's probably like, I, I would agree with you that I think that's the biggest misstep that the movie makes because there's also a sense of population where it's like in the scene when she first kind of sheds her demon skin and is mm. human, human appearing anyway, there are a lot of people in the streets who are just kind of leering at her. Yeah. And it, but then any other time that she encounters someone else, it's always just kind of like two people alone or like two people trying to either like, um, you know, assault either sexually or physically a yeah. person. There's not like that inherent like danger of like the population of a scuzzy city. Yeah. And so it feels very muted in that way. So that's just sort of a limitation of location and budget and stuff like that which you can look past because regardless it's like all right this this is kind of beautiful to look at but and i don't really feel um but i guess you know you don't have to feel that much um how should i say this you don't have to feel like she feels threatened so much because she given the opportunity is just going to mortal combat fatality someone anyway right yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and it's just so she's 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 doing just fine but yeah. i i would agree you need a more urban dilapidated violent seeming scary setting which this can't really do but or i do think something they... that reads american you know like they they're trying to dub over all the voices of the romanian actors who are coming over here and it that's where you run into like the the biggest b-movie cheese moments in this because 
God bless them. The Americans are trying to match the mouth movements of the Romanian actors who are already trying to pronounce things phonetically. And so you get some very weird pronunciations. It kind of looks like a bad lip reading video in some ways. Uh, and it, it does take you out of things a little bit. But this is kind of buoyed overall by a, kind of a real star turn here by Angela Featherstone. And I'd like to take just a minute to talk about her because um, I think she rules in this movie. Um, so at this time, yeah, like we said, she'd only had like two very small film roles. She was a, uh, a top fashion model from Canada who had been like getting on a lot of magazine covers and was kind of transitioning into uh, film acting. This is her first lead role. She would go on to have a couple of big roles throughout the 90s. I think she's probably best known for uh, being Chloe the copy girl on Friends. She is the reason that Ross and Rachel break up uh, early on in the show, which is kind of like, it was a big water coolery kind of moment. And uh, I guess her second best known project is probably The Wedding Singer. She mm -hmm. is the one who leaves Adam Sandler at the uh, altar in the beginning of that movie. So... But she popped up in a lot of different things. She was in Con Air. She was in 200 Cigarettes. She was in a lot of different movies uh, throughout that time. And she had a, a pretty thriving acting career up until a few years ago. It looks like she's kind of slowed down because she's become sort of like a jack-of-all-trades artist. Like, she's a really acclaimed, award-winning essayist. She's a short filmmaker. And she's an outspoken advocate for, like, foster children and an anti-sex trafficking worker as well as a uh, fashion photographer so she's been staying very busy doing a lot of like badass things like outside of her acting so um and I, it's it, this is one of those performances that's just like vibes you know like like it's it's not necessarily that she's putting a lot of mustard on her line reading she has to be kind of monotone in a lot of ways and the overdubbing does make some of the dialogue seem a little cheesier than it is but she has an integrity of character that she's bringing to this. She has an intensity that she's bringing to this. It's kind of just one of those things like one of those kind of immutable qualities that you can't really uh, learn, you know, that, that makes her very watchable and very intense. And I think uh, I think this is a really good showcase for her. One thing I want to say is that uh, kind of piggybacking what you were saying is that she has an intensity, but the thing that I think makes her stand out so well mm -hmm. is that she does have the intensity, but there's also this innocent like level there. Like yeah. she comes off very childlike and it, it works for the character because uh, she she's new to this world and she's wandering around and she doesn't really know how to deal with all these awful humans that are being worse than the, the demons in hell. Yeah. And she does deliver that, that it, it's very unexpected. So at one moment you're, you know, afraid of her because she yeah. just like Mortal Kombat had, you know, ripped somebody's heart out. <laughs> and then I, the next moment she's got this like childlike, uh, you know, she's, she's wearing a, a jacket and just, yeah, it's just, it's very, it, it's, it is a terrific performance in what again could be written off as just a cheesy B movie, but it's, it's really good. And I think that more than likely uh, somebody in, in another studio had to have seen that. And cause I mean, she's had such consistent work over the years. Like, yeah. they, Oh, you know, she's like legit good in uh in this yeah absolutely absolutely yeah she never became like a huge star um but i, I think she works consistently in a lot of high profile projects and i she just seems cool you know like she's she's got a good energy and uh really kind of anchors this movie because truthfully there's not a lot of other cast members uh that really pop in this movie i mean we have like nicholas worth and charlotte stewart who are kind of full moon mainstays and they they play her parents in what I think is the funniest sequence of the entire movie, because that is like, that's where you're really seeing the Matthew Bright thing, like the Forbidden Zone stuff, because a lot of that movie is parodying like 1950s suburban sitcoms or or 1950s culture. And those scenes early on in hell are just like straight up rebel without a cause. It's, it's uh, a young girl like bucking against the system, but the system just happens to be demons in hell. And Nicholas Worth is like so over the top and like sputtering and sweating and like he's so screaming gross. at her at one point and he's so committed to eating while he's screaming that I think an entire cooked ham flies out of his mouth. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and it's it feels awesome. like he's got a couple more in his cheek, like ready to go. <laughs> like, well, Nicholas Worth, I mean, you can't watch, I can't see him pop up in something without immediately thinking of Dark Man. Yeah. He gets so, the fingers cut off, right? With the with the cigar cutter. Is that him? No, he was no, he he's was the, the face um, swap, right? Yeah, he was the one. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Cause he gets the whole like face melting sequence. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, no, he rules. Oh, okay, and we do need to talk about this hell sequence because I think this this is I love a good on-screen depiction of hell. Uh, I think you really can like open up a lot of like really dark, cool fantasies you can do with this. And this one is surprisingly lavish for a full moon production. And this is where the Romanian setting is really working for them. They have all these like long empty fields and they're able to fill these trenches with fire and get all these extras like wearing cages on their heads. We have the clear like Jacob's Ladder uh, references, which uh, was was reused exactly in Witch House. Like the one thing we liked in the movie Witch House actually came from here. <laughs> and and you have all these gothic castles that are abandoned. You know, in 1994, it's still kind of Wild West over in Romania. Like there are no like filming permits. You could, you, you know, the, the film crews could kind of go where they wanted and shoot where they wanted. And uh, so they were able to get some really amazing settings for these scenes. And it's it's only a few minutes at the beginning of the movie, but it really pops and it really kind of hangs over the whole rest of the film. So impressive. It sets the tone perfectly. Yeah. And just the, the natural lighting that they're using everywhere just really makes such a huge difference. You know, a lot of the problems that you get with some of these lower budgeted B movies is just like they look like they were filmed at the DMV. You know, they're either overlit or underlit or or have like like weird flickering like fluorescent lights over them, you know. And this one just looks like it has a filmmaker's eye, you know. Um so I was very impressed by the cinematography and by the direction on this one. Yeah, I think on this particular in this particular scene it's, it's not only is it in terms of scope, one of the bigger, more impressive things they've done, there's a lot of extras, there's people doing different things. It isn't all just like one group of people doing the same thing, mm. but it manages to have sort of depth as well. Like there's stuff going on right in front of you. There's people who are beating people with clubs and then behind you, there's people with cages on their heads and behind them, there's people walking, but it manages to kind of make this hybrid of like you know a Hieronymus Bosch idea of hell yeah with you know the Jacob's ladder heads and and uh the the fiery torches and it's just it's it, it's on paper that description maybe you don't process that description and know what that in turn then looks like but then you look at it and it makes sense it's just like yeah no this is this is an awesome way to set this up. The the magnesium torches and fire uh, just provides such an amazing, you know, natural orange glow. Yeah. In that, and uh, my understanding also is that they they used uh, a different part of a location for the house that uh, uh, Veronica's house with her mm. and her parents, and. There was basically they they there were just Romanian uh, patients from a sanitarium or something wandering around who ended up then as extras <laughs> in the movie, <laughs> and I feel like I love that like that's so fitting for yeah. the guerrilla style filmmaking of what they were trying to pull off, and I just think what I've enjoyed so much in doing this show is highlighting the moments when this low budget company manages to have um how should i say this conception and execution meet yeah where it's like this is what they wanted to do and fuck it they did it they did and it they yeah. did it in mm -hmm. such a sick way and like you said a lot of times that doesn't happen because a lot of times it's like oh i see what they were trying to do i see yeah. what, what they were limited to but my favorite moments in revisiting or visiting some of these movies for the first time is just being like it's so great to see this low budget company be so resourceful to have those moments of where their conception is perfectly executed. Yeah. And I feel like the hell sequence here is one of those times. Absolutely. Yeah. No, it just this that it just really works in such a great way to like set the stage for the movie, you know, which 
itself kind of has shades of like you know this this predates all of these things but it has shades of like uh buffy the vampire slayer a little bit of blade going on in there you know this idea of like a nocturnal avenger you know who's roaming the streets and it's uh you know the the, the kill sequences that they come up with are fun there aren't a lot of them but they're pretty fun and you know aside from being able to turn into and, and, and the demon transitions here are so minimal it's literally just like her fingernails grow and we don't even see the fingernails grow it's just like star wipe and we have fingernails you know <laughs> now she's got claws and, and the little tiny horns and little tiny horns which are very cute actually like it's it's a it's almost a, like a little playful look because she's got these very kind of flimsy looking wings that pop out too um which i'm glad they didn't make her wear those the entire time because they probably would look pretty silly after a bit but it was a fun design um yeah and it's you know we we definitely get the taxi driver influences uh that that really like hit me when they went to the porno theater <laughs> where she took the, she took him on a gender swap porno porn movie. movie yeah <laughs> And her fixation on like this government figure, you know, like this this corrupt mayor of this heavy air quotes American town uh, that seems to wield like a lot of influence, which again makes me really feel like this is meant to be a New York story. But uh, well, you know, and, and that's one of the way, ways that the location kind of hindered it a little bit because I was just laughing at like the mayor, like he's just the mayor, the but he's mayor. sort of treated like he's head of like. The European consulate, right? Because he's got this giant office. I'm like, have you ever seen like a real mayor's office? It's like probably not much bigger than a civil servant office at the DMV. No, and it's like, not. but here he's, you know, it, it, he's got these busts of all these, like, you know, pr presumably like great Romanian figures in history that are just yeah, kind of yeah. lining the <laughs> hall that you walk through. And I was like, this is this is the mayor. Like, it's just uh, very funny how. Yeah, they can't shake that sort of old world feel. No, no, they never really can. And for all the energy that it brings to the movie and like the evocative uh, background and everything, it just feels wrong for the script that they're trying to, you know, the, for the story they're trying to tell. Well, but, the, you know, it, essentially, yeah, oh. I was just going to essentially you, they for they wanted New York. They wanted that grit and grime. Ironically, couldn't afford the grit and grime so they got this gothic beauty <laughs> of bucharest and what so it's just it's uh in a, sh a shame in that sense is that if they wanted it to look dirty they would have had to have paid more which they couldn't afford absolutely you know and and this bucharest <laughs> setting works so well in so many of these movies you know especially in like the subspecies series because they are upfront about them being in Romania. You know, they're they're allowed to be like, yeah, this this is a stranger in a strange land kind of story, and we're using all of the gothic beauty of the environment to in service of the story. And here, it just like it's still gorgeous to look at, but uh, it's it's clashing with I think the ultimate message that they're trying to share. Like, it isn't necessarily about human wickedness and human consumption. I think it is meant to be a reflection on American wickedness and American consumption and uh, the ways that we are affecting the world. Uh, so it does diminish it just that little bit. But and I you don't know, know what the big, the, the ongoing joke about the big feet. Like, the okay. Hitting. Yeah. Yeah. That was like thrown in like sort of as a one-off sight gag, just that she happens to have uh, the big, the, according to the nurse, the largest feet she's ever seen on a female. <laughs> uh that did did i miss it does that come up again i don't think so right like it's just kind of it, mentioned once i'm i thought it came up at least once more where uh they're just like oh these giant feet you know and i think that maybe there was a, a visual gag that there was where she had like maybe hooves or like clove you know but they couldn't afford that but they didn't change the script so they just kept Go, you know they kept going like she would have them as a demon and then when she turned into a human she just had big feet yeah you know? so i'm thinking that maybe there was supposed to be something in there and then they were just like nah, nah she'll just have big feet oh yeah those yeah. are the placeholder feet yeah, yeah i think yeah, that's yeah. That, that's really yeah i think you're totally right i think it was should have been something like hooves or something at the bottom and then they were just like well what do we have in the prop department and we have these comically large <laughs> feet and that uh, those will be part of it and that because they they give her a pair of boots at one point and they don't really go out of their way to comment on the size of the boots. And then in, on site, they appear to be normal 
size boots. I mean, maybe a little larger than a woman's boots, maybe like a men's size 12 or 13 Doc Martin or something, but yeah. not, not you Shaquille O'Neal's shoes. <laughs> <laughs> right. not. Yeah, that's kind of what they give her. Now, I was a little uncertain about what was happening at the ending and like why she had to go back to hell uh, because she she accomplishes her mission pretty easily of like like it's been hanging over the movie that she's going to encounter this mayor you know and she's going to really kind of turn him and uh, instead of going in and killing him or anything she just shows him a glimpse of what's waiting for him in the afterlife forces him to retire and join a monastery which is a, which, it's a yeah i got such oh my god i the I, I this was a scene i didn't really remember so i first saw this movie probably three or four years ago okay. i saw it for the first time i sought it out after reading it came from the video aisle yeah okay. so whenever it came from the video whenever i first got my copy of it came from the video aisle and then i feel like someone coincidentally referenced dark angel and i went okay yeah yeah and they and they said that it was a good one so i i sought it out and i remember it it being along with like some of the other ones i had already seen you know your he heads of the family etc right um i was like okay so this is one worth seeking out and, and i did but I didn't really remember the scene with the mayor, but I was just laughing to myself because at kind of out of nowhere, it becomes fateful findings for a second where the mayor <laughs> is just the like, banks. yes. Yeah. The mayor is just like, I've been lying to you this whole time. I have been a crooked politician and I am going to resign. Uh, I was just waiting for, uh, you know, that little montage of all of the politicians offing themselves. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it feels like it could have had like more of a uh, a world shaking sort of um, uh, impact like that. But but I wasn't clear. Like, did I miss where she got like an injury? Did I look down and she got hurt somehow? That yes. Was, like, fatally? She, OK. Yeah. Well, she gets it. Well, she gets shot. But before okay. she gets shot, she gets stabbed by a guy doing drugs in the stall of the ladies room. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In the in the club that they that they go to after the the porno movie but that she tells phase her really yeah well it does and actually it's funny you 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 were talking before about shot composition and the way some of these are lit i really love the in terms of aesthetics the scene where um he is max the doctor is sewing her back up yeah it's really underlit and it's got these kind of like blue hues in the background and stuff and it's like she's really only lit below her her face but her eyes are so piercing that they kind of come through yeah it's a really nicely composed shot and i was uh, was really enjoying that the that the that attention to detail but she does get shot by a police officer later on so it kind of is a yeah she does have an injury she is dealing with yeah and there, there is kind of like a deus ex machina of like this angel who's trying to appeal to the demons and like get them to forgive their daughter and bring her back home so that she can heal. And uh, Max has a great line like as she's going where he just says, I'm going to go do something terrible so I can end up in hell with you. I'm <laughs> like, all right, dude, you might want to, you know, uh, uh, get a little perspective on the stakes of this relationship a little tiny bit. But, you know, uh, I, I appreciate your dedication. Yeah, you'd known her like three days. I don't know yeah. if you want to go to hell for her. <laughs> and uh, for most in a of different days, wing of hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for most of those three days, she's been pretty weird. And it's not also not like she's gonna he's gonna end up in like a, a mansion in hell or something like that. They're kind of living a provincial life down there in the underworld. So like mm -hmm. it's not necessarily a great like maybe he's not being tortured forever, but you know, he's basically living in the suburbs. But, you know, hey, and I, I like how, I like how he deals. I like how he deals with her advances and stuff, too, because she obviously she even explicitly states, like, I don't really understand sex and relationships. Um, I want to understand it more, which is why she took him to the porno movie. Uh, and then obviously, you know, from there, he's like, no, I just want to, like, spend a normal night together. So luckily for him, he put on his best tonight at the Roxbury tuxedo and uh you know the uh, largest jacket he could find and and, and when to to whoever needed those feet <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally um but i just yeah it, it's it's so funny there i really got a kick out of when you know she just starts saying things to him like uh 
I want you inside of me. And he just looks at her and he's like, you know, you don't have to recite the movie we just watched, <laughs> <laughs> which was a really fun kind of play on like that. He's, he's not, you know, he's not trying to take advantage of her. He's just trying to understand her. And he's almost even like, can you cool it a little bit? Like, can right. you be a little bit less thirsty for me possibly like, Oh, uh, I don't want you to go and, uh, try to ram, ram this woman who said hello to me's head into the sink in the bathroom. <laughs> right. Cause hey, a reminder, we have only known each other for a very short period of time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, but it's, it's a fun part of the Featherstone performance and uh, kind of a fun contrast to the taxi driver where taxi driver is a movie about a very alienated man. And this is a movie about an alien, you know, she is coming from another world and doesn't, understand uh, uh very deeply like how we live our lives and how you know you you function but like she still manages to kind of have a travis bickle sort of feel because she has this very righteously motivated uh kind of dark mission that she's going on you know and uh, there's a lot of potential for a series here there's a lot of potential for more like you know and even the subtitle in the uh of the, of the ascent feels like a chapter one you know like it feels like there could have been more to this uh, and it's a shame that we never really got that, you know, because I, there's there's so much potential here. And it's a shame that Linda Hassani never directed another movie for Full Moon or otherwise, because uh, she's clearly very talented and she really tried to make the best of the the limitations that they had. Yeah, I would agree. I feel like this is we've said it before. I think we said it with Oblivion, maybe. Or when I say we, I mean, I, I think sure. I said <laughs> for for Oblivion, how I really sort of i wish oblivion had been a series because oblivion has all of these weird quirky elements thrown together also it's a space alien western sci-fi horror movie in a lot of ways and it was like oh how fun would it be if like red eye you know was just uh was a villain for one week and then people walk wander into the town of oblivion and it's like what's going to be waiting for them there this time i sort of feel like maybe the story of dark angel doesn't lend itself to the same type of syndicated thing like i thought for oblivion like a a briscoe county or a renegade type show but for dark angel yeah i mean well we did get the jessica alba dark angel serialized show but i think this this would have been such a fun one for to see, um, you know, Veronica's adventures and, and see her dealing with a bunch of things as she learns what it means to be human in the hellscape that is Earth. Yeah, yeah. Could have, could have been a, yeah. Yeah, so Cecil, I mean, maybe you know more than we do about sort of the fallout of this one because you mentioned before that it is one of the lesser known ones. It does come August 31st, 1994. We know we're starting to get towards the end of the Paramount deal. We know things dried up with budgets and with Paramount's feelings towards some of the what Full Moon was putting out there at this time. Like, do you know if there is any like thing that was a direct cause of this to be kind of a one and done? Was it just bad timing? Do you know if there's another project that a potential Dark Angel sequel became? Like, is there anything? that you know about to indicate like why they never went on, went forward with this? Uh, all I know is that um, I did a video on it years ago and uh, I had gotten contacted by um, Charlie's assistant who wrote me a really nice thank you letter and said how this was one of the movies um, in the full moon catalog that he was sad that uh, it just didn't take off. I think it really was uh maybe maybe ahead of its time or possibly uh it just wasn't what the audience wanted in 1994 you know they wanted more of the the trancers and puppet master and all that all those ones that were the big you know they they had some sort of element of action and whatnot and this really was more of a slower film and like i said it had the romance element in there and i think that he kind of liked uh, the way that it was made, it, I never got an exact answer, but uh, all I know is that he had said that, uh, well, I 
gotten the message that this was one of the uh, unsung heroes of the Full Moon catalog. And as a thank you, uh, he sent me a really nice piece of um, the promotional art for the film that he signed. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's and awesome. I thought that was really cool. So, yeah, this one was one that uh, I think he was because there's a few. Now, there's more known about, like, uh, Dr. Mordred and whatnot as far as, you know, they had a trilogy plan. And then that's the, and I think this kind of came at a point where um, they were hoping that it would do well. And if it did do well, then I think that they were going to figure out how to do a sequel. But I don't believe that they had one planned. They had it on the table that if it was a hit that they could do it. But I don't think that it took off for whatever reason. So And it's, it's crazy uh, because... If you would have three to four years later, if this gets released on the heels of Buffy, I think that audience, that target market is sort of reignited. Mm -hmm. And I think I think maybe you have a slightly different outcome. I mean, I we know in hindsight that Paramount wasn't giving them the money anymore by 96, 97. But it had had in a perfect world if the Paramount deal was still going strong and Full Moon were getting these budgets that they were getting during their heyday and buffy hits in 97 and then you have like the rise of the kind of teen led dimension horror movies of the of the late 90s and then even other things that aren't as much horror but still sort of uh dealing with forces of evil like charmed mm, something yeah. along those lines mm -hmm. <clears throat> if this would have released a few years later you know maybe we could have had a sequel or or a series and Veronica could have been part of those full moon Avengers, you know, like we, yeah. it, it is kind of sad because I think, you know, we're getting sort of into what I feel is the final thoughts part of the yeah, episode yeah. so far, but I really like this one. I think if you asked me to see, it's funny because one thing we've talked about with full moon movies with guests before is somehow, sometimes we don't feel like the original movie is the best one in a series. And so I I sometimes if I pull a list of oh let me let me make a list of my top 10 full moon movies chances are they'll have a sequel mm -hmm. in there or a few of them actually I mean mm -hmm. I think they may be like Trancers you know the original but it's not even a full moon movie that's an empire movie um but like your puppet master 3 subspecies 2 oh, but then there's 2 is like I love sus subspecies one, but yeah, two is so awesome. Yeah, it really kind of one. blows it out of the water. Yeah, yeah, and so there are a few like standalone ones that make it make it to my list. I mean, Steve and I both fell head over heels for Blood Dolls, which is yeah. one we didn't know about before we watched it for the show, <laughs> and we were just like, "Man, this movie rules!" And now yeah. it's up there. Um, and then like Shrunken Heads and, and Oblivion as just being these like really kooky weird things that full moon, and dark angel i think would make that short list for me of ones that i think are the best and i don't I'll, I'll talk about it again in a second but we'll I'll, we'll bring up when we start to advertise what's coming up soon something that i think might also penetrate that short list maybe for both myself and steve but yeah yeah it's it's kind of sad that this is so <clears throat> underseen but i will say that i do appreciate that this is a movie that has been reappraised by a lot of the right people. Like, I feel like the audience for this movie is there now in terms of like, I think this is very widely recognized as one of Full Moon's most sort of thought through entries like this one i think a lot of people look to this one and say no this is a time when they did it right this is a time when they did a lot of things and there's even some professional reviews of this one too where people are like yes this is a b movie it's silly but it's entertaining as hell and there's a lot of it that really works and so i'm glad that this one is finding that life now even though it's you know 30 years later um so maybe it didn't catch on. Maybe it wasn't, you know, the most lucrative. Maybe it didn't sell or rent as many units and it didn't demand six sequels and crossover movies like Charles Band had hoped. But this is one that when I've had conversations with people since the show has been going on, like, oh, we're doing full moon movies and like, oh, what about this one? And even people who like 
don't consider themselves just B movie enthusiasts, just movie enthusiasts in general have actually name dropped this one. And they're yeah. like, oh, did you guys do Dark Angel yet? And I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. no, it's coming. It's coming. And they're like, oh, I love that one. And so it's just, it's really nice to, to know that at least now all of those efforts aren't being wasted. And, you know, we're, we're here talking about it with somebody who likes it and appreciates it for an audience of people who are going to download this episode who like and appreciate the film too. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad we landed here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm, I feel the same way. I really enjoyed this one. I thought it really cut through and uh, it is definitely one you should add to your short list. Check it out. Um, and we really want to thank Cecil for being here again. Thank you so much for uh, uh, bringing this movie to us and uh, giving us a chance to watch it sooner. Uh, we had so much fun. Where can people find uh, all of the stuff that you've been working on? Uh, you can find me over at uh, goodband, uh, goodbandflix.com uh, as well as uh, just goodbadflix on YouTube uh, as well as uh, Twitch and all your various social medias. Yeah. Cecil, I wanted to ask, so like I, I love Good Bad Flicks as a channel. Uh, you've definitely been a, a gateway for me into some pretty obscure stuff that I maybe wouldn't have discovered on my own. So you kind of fast tracked me into some of it. And uh, is there any like what do you consider to be either like an entry point for someone who wa- wants to check out your YouTube channel? And also, are there any like recent ones that you put out on there that you're really proud of that you think people would enjoy that maybe is about like a movie that people should seek out that they're not too familiar with uh well if you're looking for the more serious side of me uh i would say check out something like my video on uh, the thing or the crow city of angels where i'm talking about um how both of those movies went through all kinds of problems and the end results was not necessarily uh, what we were supposed to get. Uh, I think there are two movies that uh, like were essentially ruined by the studios. And uh, I talked to a lot of the people involved and got the, uh, got the story of what actually happened and opened a lot of people's eyes to uh, uh, you know, why these films are, I don't want to say as bad as they are, but I mean, it's, it's just not what they should have been. So uh, Mm. if you're looking for something more serious, uh, if you're looking for something more silly, uh, pretty much anything of the full moon movies, for the most part, I like to have a lot of fun with them, uh, make some jokes and kind of goof on them a little bit. I I just love them because they're, they're perfect fodder for that. Um, And then as far as something, uh, a more recent one that I did, I'm really proud of the video I did on Free Jack. Oh, Um, nice. Oh, yeah. Free Jack was a movie that, oh, my God, did did the director just got completely destroyed by um, the head of the uh, production company. Just really, really, really was just ruining his film brought him in was like i want to make this movie this way and they were like okay and then as soon as he came in and started making the movie his way they're like no we want you to make it this way and he was at one point was just begging them to fire him because he's like this i'm I'm making this isn't the movie that i want to make yeah and doing really ridiculous things like um they had originally hired uh linda fiorentino for the renee russo part uh, like, because this was way before Rainer. So anyway, they had Linda Fiorentino in, uh, filmed her for a few days. Um, the head of the studio was like, fire her. She's the 100% the problem with why this movie doesn't work. And the director, uh, Jeff Murphy, was upset because he's like, no, she she was perfect for it. Why do you want her fired? And the the producer was like, because she doesn't give me a hard on. Oh, God. And so they ended up Jesus. hiring Rene Russo, who uh, was a uh, model at mm. the time, and brought her in. And she did a very good job, but uh, like was like looking back on it and thinking, "Oh my God, this would have been so much better with Linda Fiorentino," especially because uh, at that point there was already pre-production and Emilio Estevez had already worked with her and built up a bit of a rapport. Mm -hmm. So now he filmed all these scenes with Linda Fiorentino and now they're already into filming and he has to do them all over again with Rene Russo. And it was a very different energy than Linda Fiorentino. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. 
And so, uh, yeah, it just, it was a completely different thing. So yeah, I really, really am happy with how that one turned out. And, I thought you were going to uh, say they fired or replaced her with Mick Jagger. <laughs> <laughs> Mick actually was there. If if I don't want to go into is I don't go talk about the whole episode. But Mick, I got so much more respect. Not that I didn't have any respect for him, mm. but so much more respect for him for what he did in the movie. He's kind uh, of fun in that movie. Record. Yeah, yeah. He had a lot of fun, and he was super duper cool with the. He did a really really great thing for the director. Oh, that's awesome. The, the nice. So. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. Free Jack is a movie that I like. I haven't watched it in a long time, so maybe this is kind of a good excuse to watch your video and then maybe check the movie out again. Uh, if you like what we do on our show here, then jump on to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Leave us a quick five-star rating and maybe a brief review if you feel so inclined to do so. Uh, if you want to know what we're up to, you can follow us on all social media on Instagram. We're at Puppet Masters underscore Castle Freaks. I am at underscore Jallo underscore Jerry. And Steve is at Minotaur Matador. Um, you can find us on, you know, X and Threads and YouTube and anywhere that you search the podcast name. You'll be able to find us. Um, send us messages. Email us at PuppetMastersCastleFreaks at gmail.com. We love getting interaction uh, from people and reading your thoughts and feedback and everything else. Uh, this is not the only show, though, that Steve would like to plug. So, Steve, what else have you got going on? Absolutely. I'm also uh, the host of a show called Cinema Arcade. That's cinema and arcade mashed together. We watch movies and then we play video games based on those movies. So we have a lot of fun stuff coming up. I know we have a... Uh, episode coming up on what i would argue is one of the best uh games based on a movie uh chronicles of riddick uh one of those mm. games one of those properties where the game is actually superior to any of the films and uh, i'm excited to get into that one we've also recently done episodes on both versions of the italian job and uh, a couple of other things that are coming out that are going to be really fun so check that out and as for us next week, you know, we've enjoyed our little vacation in early 90s Romania so much that we're going to hang out here for just a little while longer because uh, we are continuing to advance through the subspecies series. That's right. We are going to be coming back next week with Bloodlust colon subspecies three and Vampire Journals, which is a officially unofficial uh, spin-off of the super uh, the the subspecies series so uh i'm not familiar with that one i've seen th i've seen part three i've not seen vampire journals but i, I have a bold pretty prediction good. and yeah. i can't i could be proven wrong about this but i have a feeling that one of these movies is going to find its way reasonably high in your rankings oh good to know good to know all right well i'm excited to check it out excited to get back into that series uh, so thank you again to Cecil Trachenberg for being here, and uh, we will see you next time. Trachenberg, so I'm sorry, wrong. I said your name so wrong. I apologize. Say, don't worry. I get, <laughs> people either get my first or last or both names wrong. So. Yeah.